Might a fiction writer offer more insights into India's future than the experts and analysts? We'll talk to an author who hopes so. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Our guest today is Manil Suri, novelist, specialist on the phenomenon that is India in the 21st century. Welcome, Mr. Suri. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Tell us, uh, wh what does it mean when you say you're, you're trying to understand uh, India and its changes in the 21st century. What's, what's your starting point? Because there seems to be so much subject matter. Well, exactly. There's just too much subject matter. And uh, myself, I'm basically a mathematician, too. And this is something that uh, I've gotten into writing novels. And the subject is India, because that's where I'm from. Uh, and our novelists look at any kind of topic in a very different way than someone who would be an academic or a specialist. Uh, novels give you a sort of uh, kaleidoscopic view of something, you know, little flashes of insight perhaps, and perhaps try to give you a broader picture as well. Um, so the India that I'm talking about is first of all very personal. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that come from my own history, from my parents' history, uh, from growing up there that are put into the novels. And then uh, from that starting point, how this can evolve. I'm, I'm, I've, actually seen, I've actually seen so many changes. And you know, you, whatever you see, you want to put into these novels. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm working with. I'm kind of curious. Your specialty is math, but you have written two novels. And you're working on a third. And um, wh where did the inspiration to write come from? Do you have writing in your background or in your family history? Uh, not really, but uh, when you're growing up in India, you're always encouraged to have at least two or three different hobbies. Uh, so you know, it's not just stamp collecting or something, but you're really encouraged to, to be somehow multifaceted. And so writing was one of the things that I used to do, and I used to also paint a little. But when I first became a professor of mathematics, I said, okay, I need, I need to go back to a hobby. Uh, just because I don't want my academic career to define me as a person, and you know that's my whole life. And so I started writing almost in secret, really. I didn't want my colleagues to know about it. And I would actually go and go to a writing uh, workshop that was in Washington. I lived in Baltimore, uh, all very hush-hush, didn't tell anyone about it. And uh, I remember one summer when I was actually working on this novel and getting close to the end of it, I went away for a retreat for a whole month. And I told everyone I was writing a calculus textbook. And when I came back, they said, well, can we see it? And I said, no, it's not done yet. I'll have to go again next summer. So most people in my department only knew about my writing career um, when things started getting published. So it was almost a covert operation, your pursuit of, of writing and, and, and books and so Absolutely. Forth. Did you ever write the calculus book? I haven't, not so far. Is, is, uh, that, is that a real I, project? No, or? no, it was all made <laughs> up. <so. laughs> Very interesting. So wh when you look at um, subjects that are of interest to you, how, how do you decide where to go? Is it culture that attracts you? Is it uh, society? Is it uh, the, you know, the economic side of life? Is it politics? Or is it just a, a, a mix of everything? I think it is a mix of everything. Um, and that's, that's what something I can say after having written. I think uh, when I started writing, um, it was not really about India. It was just you know, a hobby, as I said. And uh, it was sort of stilted. And I really think I hit my stride, so to speak, when I started writing about India. And these were short stories. These, these, these were fictional pieces. And uh, the first novel that came out, finally, uh, it really looks at the whole society uh, in terms of a microcosm that is a building. So it looks at this building in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, 
Uh, and it has a whole bunch of different types of people in this, just like India does, just like there are all these different classes and castes and uh, social cultures and languages. So also in this building, there's a bit of everything represented. Uh, and the whole book became, an, became a sort of uh, metaphor for the evolution of India. Uh, so that was the first book. And uh, again, I think what attracted me uh, was really the people more than anything else, the interaction between, um, between characters, rather than you know, looking at it at, in a more analytical way, analytical way about the um, economics you mentioned or mm -hmm. some other aspect like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about writing, and when, when you first started getting into writing, uh, did you have specific uh, models in mind? Did you have certain writers who inspired you, or did you follow your own course? I think I sort of followed my own course. I, I know while I was in India, um, while I was growing up, uh, Indian fiction wasn't really uh, what it is now. The, there were some writers like uh, R.K. Narayan comes to mind. He was probably the most popular, and I read quite a bit of his work. Uh, but there weren't any people that I would say, okay, this was my hero, and I always wanted to write a book like that. Uh, it was something that I stumbled into, and um, I think that was good because it just allows you to go in a different direction, so to speak. When you think about the situations and people you've written about, is there a really compelling character that is based on someone you, you knew or observed in real life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, writers are thieves, and that's all we do, right? We, <laughs> uh, we take little bits like magpies and churn them into, re regurgitate them into something new. Uh, but there is definitely some character like that, one character like that, many characters like that. But uh, the first book is called The Death of Vishnu. And people often ask me, you know, like Vishnu is the name of a Hindu god. Why did you, why did you have that in your title? Because that's a very provocative title. Vishnu doesn't actually ever die in Hindu mythology. So when you say the death of Vishnu, people might say, well, that's sacrilegious. But I actually knew a man named Vishnu uh, who used to live in our building in Bombay when I was growing up. And he would you know, often be drunk, and he would be on the steps. He would say hello to me. And that's all I knew about him. And uh, the way the book evolved is I went back to India to visit my parents in about 1995 or so. And Vishnu was very sick. He was on the steps. Uh, and he actually died. He died there on the steps. And the municipality came and took his body away. And um, because no one wanted to pay for anything for him. So, so that was very, um, it was a very troubling death. And I started writing a short story based on that, but really making, uh, making up a fictional Vishnu whom I didn't know, uh, making up some sort of structure that would give more meaning to his death. And that's how I started the first book. So even though Vishnu is a fictional character in the novel, he is based on someone that is real. Now, have you had complaints from people who thought you were doing something sacrilegious? Initially, there were a few people who hadn't uh, read the book and kind of started at the title. Uh, but then once it became clear that this was, there was nothing sacrilegious in the book, in fact, it's, if anything, it's a primer on Hinduism in many ways. Uh, this was a topic that I didn't know much about. And I read a lot of the religious texts and so on. And I found them you know, spiritually, almost secularly uh, inspiring. Um, when that all came out through reviews and so on, then I don't think there was any ever any question that you know there wasn't anything to be object uh, to object to in that book. Now, when you write, is is much of it from your creative imagination, or do you actually go on site and try to find inspiration in the environment, or or both? Well, the first book, um, I think, I think what happens with a lot of writers is. Uh, you've lived, you know, I, I was, what, almost 40 when it came out. Um, so you've lived all this life, and you try to put everything in there. So that was certainly things that were already within me, so to speak. And it was a way of expressing all that, putting it in a framework. Uh, I didn't really have to do any research for that. Uh, once I was done with the first book, then the perennial question for writers is, well, what do you do after this, right? 
you've used up everything in your own story. So like any good thief, what you do is you steal from your parents. So I started writing about them. Uh, and again, it's not a question of uh, writing everything exactly as it happened. I mean, my parents often tell me about their story where uh, they were in Pakistan and they were Hindu. And uh, they got married on July 10th, 1947 which was about one month before the, cart the, the partition occurred and the country was split apart and they had to flee. They didn't even open their wedding presents. And so all through my life I'd been thinking about this, been hearing about this, and when I became a writer I said, okay, that's the perfect thing to write about in the second book. But when I actually started writing it, well, okay, so they didn't open their wedding presents, so what? You know, where's the story in that? And there's so many books on partition and so on. So then you sort of take little bits of that. You take this idea of a family that evolved from Pakistan, came to India, and then maybe you try and trace out what might have happened, how this event really affected the family, and um, by extension, the whole country, how this wound has really shaped the destiny of India. So that's what you try to encapsulate in a story. And so that was not really um, based on my parents anymore. Uh, that was the inspiration, but then you know, it was filled with a lot of stuff. So for that book, I really had to do a lot of historical research. Um, and I went back to Bombay several times, went to the Times of India, they have this microfilm office, and I looked through these different newspapers from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. goes up to the 80s, uh, just more or less to get an idea of what the country was like then, rather than very specific. Well, there were specific bits of information too, but you try to absorb the country too. What, what is it about India today that most fascinates you? Is, is there some aspect of India's rise that is most appealing, most interesting to you? I think um, any, any rise like that, you know, it always has a good part, an appealing part, but there's also a, a, a less appealing part. So when you uh, look at a city like Bombay, which is Mumbai now, when I go back there, uh, it's just it's just amazing how much prosperity there is compared to when I was growing up. Uh, how many cars there are, how much, uh, you know, how much advertising there is, uh, how westernized it is. And now people would argue that's good, but there are others who would argue that's bad too. And certainly when you're stuck in traffic and you're trying to get to the airport, uh, the last time I was there, I actually had to walk a mile and a half from my cab because the traffic was completely jammed getting to the airport in the last mile and a half I actually walked with my bags. So, mm, that so uh, a that's a lot of fun. So that's the downside of uh, anything, any kind of progress. But really what's changed a lot, I think, is, um, and this, this I think is for me the real key, it's the self-perception that people there have. When I was growing up, uh, you can't imagine how different it was. India was sort of the basket case of the world. You know, we were always portrayed as just this horrible land full of poverty. Uh, the image that we had was always that, well, we need Russian help or we need American help. We we're always begging for arms or food or whatever. And now it's very different. Now people have this can-do aspect. They um, have a much better image of the country. Uh, and they realize that it is one of the players or will be one of the big players in the future. So that's, that's been a huge change and that percolates down uh, all the way from the top to the bottom, I think. You're working on a new book. Um, is there anything you want to share about that or is that still a secret at this point? Well, it's, uh, it, the reason I keep these things uh, secret is I've learned through experience that once you, once you start talking about it, I, I actually even gave a reading of my second book uh, in New York once before it was published. And then when the book came out, people said, well, where's that thing? Where are those characters? And it all disappeared. Everything had changed by the time the book got published. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big reason. But um, what's, what's happened is that the first book was really a snapshot of India, the death of Vishnu. It was a snapshot of India, of Bombay, really, um, in the 80s or 90s, something like that. And the second book really traces the evolution of India from its birth uh, into the 70s or 80s. So it's really a historical book in some sense. And so there's only one thing left, and that's the future. Mm -hmm. And so the third book is really what might happen in the very near future. 
And uh, we were talking a little bit about how thankless a task it is to, to do that. Um, and certainly if I was writing a nonfiction book predicting India's future, which there have been many excellent books, but you know that each one of them is going to have several things that didn't come true. Mm -hmm. So what does, a, what does an author do? What does a novelist do in such a situation? And I know I'm going to be asked this question when the book comes out, so it's great that I'm answering it, <laughs> practicing with you here. Uh, but you know, I've thought about it a lot, and I think the job of a novelist isn't really to predict the future so much as it is to look at various aspects of the future. If you look at uh, a financial company when they do financial modeling, what they do is they look at they look at different outcomes with different probabilities. You know, uh, there might be a very low probability that something might happen. Uh, for example, the whole financial crisis with the uh, mortgages and so on. You know, these were all supposed to be very low probability of these going south. Uh, and then there might be things with high probability that are less exciting. For a novelist, I think you have to look at the things with low probability. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at a real far out case, like what might happen, you know, what could happen. And as long as it's something that has some finite probability, that is somehow uh, something that could happen, I think that's, that's all I need to do. Uh, and through that prism, you kind of explore what the country is doing, what its people are doing. So it's not so much you know, saying this is gonna, going to happen, but what could happen. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a great way to stimulate the creative process. We do that in the classroom quite often. We have students imagine right. what-if scenarios, or we have them write what they think might be headlines for um, newspapers, magazines, blogs, and so forth mm -hmm. a year from now or two years right. from now. And, right. and sometimes out of that discussion come some, some very interesting possibilities. Yeah, the problem is that you don't have reviewers, nasty reviewers, who are underlining each thing that didn't come true and saying, hey, wait, wait a second, that, that's impossible, or that's not, gonna, that's not gonna be very likely. So one has to play with that. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we talk about the rise of India, and most of the specialists I've come across seem to view this development in very, very positive terms. It doesn't appear that there are negative aspects associated with this. I'm just curious as to what your perspective is, do you, do you see India continuing to rise and gain an influence politically, economically, and so forth around the world without any agenda? Um, yeah, I think so. In terms of the agenda part, I, I don't think India has these uh, you know, aspirations of uh, getting bigger like some other countries we talked about. Um, but. I think what's, what, what for me is the biggest problem related to this rise is how much of it is real. Uh, it's sort of like the stock market where things get very inflated and then there's a huge correction. And uh, already we are seeing that in some sense where people are pulling back investments from India. And part of the reason for that is uh, that, that there are still big problems in the infrastructure, in education, in corruption, and you, know, you name it. And uh, you know the rise has been so much in the news, and it's such a hype thing. China and India, you know, they're rising, 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 um, that people lose sight of what's really going on under the surface. Uh, I do think that some of these problems will be surmounted, but it's going to take some real effort and some time. Um, the country keeps growing economically. I mean, the growth rate is still nine percent a year, so so there's certainly no doubt about that. Um, but you know there is this question. There's this, always this looming question: Is is something going to happen, and suddenly it falls, and then maybe rises more slowly? What, what kind of role would you like India to have in the future, in terms of managing the world and United Nations and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have some sort of big picture perspective on this? Well, I think uh, what was very interesting, and people, I don't hear this anymore, which is very strange, and I touched upon this a little bit in, you know, when, I, when I was writing the second book, is um, just what uh, Indira Gandhi started, the non-aligned movement, where there was this real idea that, okay, there can be countries that do not necessarily throw their lot in with the West, perhaps, or with the Soviet bloc. And that just, you just don't hear that anymore. And so I think that maybe a resurrection of that in some form, maybe not the same way, maybe more friendly towards everyone, 
that might make sense that India could really play that kind of role where uh, they could be non-aligned. The, the problem with that, of course, is that um, since their economic growth is so, so rapid, they're going to need resources. And you know, that comes into uh, like oil resources and so on. So they're competing for these things. So I don't know how it all would play out economically, uh, because at that time they were also economically non-aligned. They were isolated, which we aren't now. Uh, but still, I think politically it would make sense. Um, and I think that's still uh, there in some of the leadership in India. They're wary of being too pro-West or too pro-any faction. So I think that might make sense. Is, you, you talk about the good and the, and the bad side of the rise of any given country. Is, is there something about the bad side that you have a personal interest in that you think deserves uh, more of a priority? Something that could be fixed, something that could be addressed in a constructive way? Well, I think the, the bad side is that um, people are really ignoring. It's the things that get ignored. Um, a lot of the economic benefits, uh, as in any economic rise, are going to a small percentage of the population. And what's being lost, or what's not being paid attention to enough, perhaps, is the rest of the population. And the key thing is always education, I find, maybe you know, being a professor myself. Uh, but I do think that's where, that's where a lot more can be done. Um, and I'm not sure how to do it, but there are there's great talent in India, and somehow if uh, you know these scandals and everything, corruption, if somehow could be swept away, and if the country could really focus on this one goal of education, that, that could be something that could make a real difference. Mm -hmm. Is it a question of capacity, or is it, is it something else that you're talking about as far as addressing the educational needs? There are a lot of problems. Uh, in the educational system. Uh, one of the problems is that um, for a large part of the country, uh, like people who live in villages, for instance, uh, there are notoriously uh, corrupt and bad instances of how money is spent. You know, People will throw money at this problem. They'll hire teachers. Teachers will never show up in the classrooms. They'll take the money and won't show up. And so these kids aren't getting anything out of it. And so somehow that's, that has to be fixed, where uh, there's still a huge percentage of the population that lives in villages. And how do you give those people a chance? The desire is definitely there. Everyone has seen TVs, and you know, the, uh, people are being bombarded with images of upward mobility, including in villages. So people definitely want their kids to be educated. But the capacity in cities, it's a problem of capacity. In villages, it's a problem of actually getting anything there. Uh, so that's, you know, there's just not enough going around. And I don't know how to fix it. As you look to the future 40, 50 years from now, if you can see out uh, that far, do, do you see a very positive prospect for India? Um, or, or do you see a, a mix of this I, sort of good and bad as you've been talking about? I'm having so much trouble with my novel looking just three or four years into okay. the future. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm the right person to ask about 40 or 50 years. Uh, you know, it's so hard to say what's going to happen. Um, it's, it, I, think, I think what I can say, though, is that the next five or 10 years will really tell us what might happen. Uh, one of the things is that the population has sort of slowed down in its growth of increase, so that's certainly on the good side. Uh, the other thing is that there is growth in the second tier and even third tier cities in India. So there is uh, this prosperity that is trickling in to, to uh, the smaller cities, not just the big uh, Bombay, Calcutta, and so on. So that's another thing that it's actually spreading out, and maybe it'll reach you know, even lower down in the chain. So those are all positive signs. So 40 or 50 years, well, you have to remember the country is only what, it only got independence in 47. So it's only like 63 years old. So you're talking about twice the lifetime almost of the country. So I'm not going to answer that. OK, well, with that, well, thank you very much, Mr. Suri, for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Brucia. We'll see you next time.
This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office.